One, two, three, three. Let's bring in Paul Feinbaum, who hosts his own radio show on the Paul Feinbaum Radio Network in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, Paul, how are the developments of the past few days playing in SEC country? Really not very well, David. Fans down here are traditionalists like Mac Brown, and they don't think a lot of Texas A&M. Uh, they think a lot of Texas and Oklahoma and schools like that, but they think Texas A&M is an also-ran, and they're not very excited about them joining the league. All right, so could the SEC be holding out here? You, you mentioned Oklahoma. Could they be hoping to get a, perhaps a more high-profile school out of the Big 12? Well, remember a year ago, Mike Slive talked to both Oklahoma and Texas A&M during the explosion we had back in June, and he thought he had A&M, never could quite get Oklahoma, then it all fell apart. But Mike Slive, as Pat said, is a very shrewd guy. He's a lawyer, and I think he's concerned about the legal issues here. And I think the legal issues are the reason why Texas A&M isn't being introduced today as the SEC's 13th member. Hey, Paul, as we all know, the SEC is doing just fine in its current setup. So how, how much <laughs> of a priority is it for that conference to expand? Well, it's not a priority in terms of national prominence. Uh, the SEC has five national championships in a row. Five is on the SEC media guide uh, this fall. But it, you said it earlier, the television aspect of it, the, the Longhorn Network, the SEC feels like maybe it's been left behind with what Larry Scott's doing out west and, of course, uh, what the, even the ACC and the Big Ten have done. So I think that's the only reason why the SEC would look to 14 or 16 is to improve an already very strong television presence. Hey, Pat, you wrote on ESPN.com that the college sports landscape could radically change if A&M decides to jump. How so? Well, I, you know, I think that really could be the domino, and it's ironic, David, because we're talking about a football program that's three games over 500 in the last nine seasons. We're not talking about a national superpower here, but Texas A&M, with the, with the Texas market there, is a prize commodity. And if they leave, if they need 14 and they go get Missouri, then all of a sudden, you know, what happens to the Big 12? It's probably not a viable entity anymore. Then the Pac-12 may get interested again and say, all right, Texas, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Texas Tech, you got to come with us. The Big East, I know, would like to go ahead and say, hey, Kansas, Kansas State, Iowa State, we'll take you guys. But then somebody else may be saying, wait, if we're in the ACC, we need to bulk up. We'll take some people out of the Big East. It could be a complete free-for-all. And I've talked to a lot of ADs out there who are really nervous kind of watching how this is going to unfold because Texas A&M improbably could be the lever that changes everything. Yeah. Uh, Colorado and Nebraska, we saw them leave the conference last year. Is, is there a real possibility that the Big 12 disintegrates if A&M leaves, Pat? I think there is a chance of it, yeah. I mean, you look, they've, as you said, they've already lost two entities. Texas A&M uh, would be a very valued uh, third entity that would go. If Missouri goes, that's four. All of a sudden, you're down to eight. And while the Big Eight was once a great idea, I'm not sure it's going to float that many boats at this time. Uh, I think there would be diminishing uh, confidence in uh, Dan Beebe as the commissioner. I do think that some of those other schools would look around and say, we got to get while the getting is good, and they might be better off going somewhere else as opposed to bringing in BYU and teams from Conference USA and trying to rebuild themselves that way. I know there's some other schools out there that, you know, if, if approached by the Big 12 would say no thank you because they think that that thing is doomed to failure basically because of the uneven setup that has been put into place last year when they tried to save the conference. Guys, let's talk about the, the, uh, the elephant in the room, the, this Longhorn Network. It's a joint venture between ESPN and the University of Texas. It's, it's sort of created its, its own role here and it, it's having an impact on the way we perceive college football right now. Paul, in your mind, what changes has the Longhorn Network basically wreaked on college football at this point? Well, I think it's already uh, been a big factor in Texas A&M. And, and back to Texas A&M in connection to the Longhorn Network, A&M knew things like this were going to happen. They made a very bad decision a year ago saying no to the SEC. Remember, when everyone was going to west, uh, A&M was going east, and then they all stopped. And I think it's just the fact that they've now discovered uh, the fine print on the Longhorn Network. But to me, they, 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 they saw it coming. And I have no problem with what ESPN is doing with the Longhorn Network. That's the way the game is going. We've seen it with the Big Ten Network. I feel pretty, pretty certain that the SEC is heading in the same direction in a broader scale. We've, we've seen the, the Pac-12 now do the same thing. So cry me a river for A&M just finding out what we all knew a year ago. Pat, your thoughts? Yep. You know, I, I'm frankly a little bit troubled by the Longhorn Network, and I know it's been a very uh, you know, positive business situation, I believe, for our employers at ESPN. But 
what it does to me is it singles out a specific school as opposed to a collective and when you do that you are essentially playing favorites and when you have a contract with a collective with the big 12 that's going to cause problems and if it gets into an uneven playing field and espn is part and parcel of creating an uneven playing field then i can understand why fans of other teams would have and it creates a perception for those of us on the dot-com side and on the news side that are covering these teams that we are going to play favorites as well so while i can understand there's a lot of good reasons for it it also is a troublesome situation i'm glad we're actually talking about it hey paul you bring all this into the equation how do you see this whole thing sorting out as far as a and m the sec the big twelve and all of it i think the explosion is here i think a and m will join the sec whether it's next week or next month sometime in the near future i agree with pat on missouri and i think it's open season then and the landscape changes and i think you'll see four super conferences and hopefully then we'll get to a, a playoff which we need be desperately in college football hey, pat historically we, conferences have had traditions they've had you know you, you sort of have a feeling of, of consistency that all blew up a short time ago what does this mean for college football when there is such shifting of teams and schools in conferences? It means tradition is for sale, David. That's, that's the bottom line, and that's a sad <laughs> thing as far as I'm concerned. I am a traditionalist, but that's a reality. And you know what? Everybody has got to go out, I guess, and look for the best interest of themselves. But in the process of doing that, nobody's looking out for the best interest of the whole of college football. There's nobody really in charge. There's not a central leader that I think can bring everybody to the table and say let's go about this in the same fashion and so you've got basically an oligarchy and a bunch of separate states out there that are kind of going for their own and I'm not sure that's the best thing going forward. College sports waiting now to find out just who joins the SEC, what Texas A&M does and then as uh, Pat mentioned we may see the dominoes fall. Pat Forty and Paul Feinbaum good enough to join us today on Outside the Lines.